So I just want to introduce myself to those of you who don't know me. I'm Amit Bose, Deputy Administrator of the Federal Railroad Administration. And as uh, Jim just noted, I've also been nominated to be uh, Administrator. Uh, thank you to Jim, to Sean, and um, RPA staff for inviting me to be with you today and discuss very exciting recent developments affecting passenger rail in the United States. I first became familiar with RPA's work and advocacy on behalf of your members when I served at FRA and at the US Department of Transportation during the Obama-Biden administration. Back then, FRA was implementing an unprecedented investment made possible by the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. And during that time, we made substantial progress uh, on rail in the United States. We would like to have kept it going, but in, unfortunately, around 2011, uh, there was a pause in providing continued funding to the effort, even though the projects that started with that funding were built out over uh, several years. And I'd like to think that the Recovery Act did manage to accomplish quite a bit. And some of you, and, and we all are the beneficiaries of that on, on a daily basis. It's once again, my honor and privilege to continue those vital efforts to help passenger rail take its rightful place in America's intermodal transportation system. The inherent efficiencies of rail are unrivaled and now is the time to take advantage of them. President Biden believes we must invest in our country and our people by creating good jobs, tackling the climate crisis, and promoting sustained equitable economic growth for decades to come. Rail transportation is at the heart of those goals. Transportation Secretary P Pete Buttigieg and I strongly agree with the president that we are on the precipice of starting America's great second rail revolution. The simple fact is America needs passenger rail to meet the demands of projected population growth and satisfy public demand for mobility options. Our interstate highway system and commercial aviation industry are indispensable, but for too long rail has been the forgotten mode. The time has come to change that. As we look to revitalize passenger rail within the United States, it's important to understand and the important role that Amtrak has in moving people both along the Northeast Corridor and on long distance service. Obviously, as outspoken proponents and champions of Amtrak and passenger rail more generally, I needn't say more about that. You understand better than most how an expanded and vastly improved passenger rail system, one benefiting of our country can transform rail, commerce, leisure, and connectedness. I commend you and thank you for making your views known throughout the country. For many of us, the past year and a half has been a challenge as we cope with COVID-19. Amtrak has been especially hit hard by the downturn in travel demand. Since rejoining FRA in January, I've worked very closely with Amtrak and other passenger railroads to help them recover and prosper long-term. In response to the pandemic, FRA obligated funding to Amtrak to provide relief from lower passenger ridership. And those efforts were definitely thanks in large part to Congress and the Biden-Harris administration as well. In February, FRA obligated close to a billion dollars from the Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act. Then in April, FRA obligated another $1.7 billion from the American Rescue Plan. As we recover from the pandemic, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, or IIJA for short, outlines investments that we need to transform our nation's infrastructure. This once in a generation transformational investment in America's critical infrastructure includes a total of $66 billion for freight and passenger rail. The investments in rail would not only replace and repair our aging infrastructure and achieve a state of good repair, 
but also increase efficiency, expand capacity, and rail transportation options across the country. From the Gulf Coast to the West Coast, from the Pacific Northwest to the Northeast, from where I grew up in Georgia to the heartland on all across this country, people are eager for expanded rail options. I hear from you every day. If enacted into law, the investments plan will create good paying union jobs, promote economic growth, combat the climate crisis and advance equity. The historic bipartisan infrastructure deal makes the largest investment in public transit, the largest investment in passenger rail since the creation of impact, the single largest dedicated bridge investment since the construction of the interstate highway system, the largest investment in clean drinking water and wastewater infrastructure in our history. The bill ensures that everyone has access to reliable high-speed internet and helps us tackle the climate crisis. As we've been witnessing unprecedented floods, wildfires, hurricanes, reducing greenhouse gas emissions that contribute to global warming is an imperative. The rail investments that we make will position us well to achieving greenhouse gas reductions. The bipartisan effort on rail is a huge development, one that we have not had ever on this scale or this basis at, for some time. And it's important to note that this isn't an Amtrak bill, it's a bill for all types of rail service. The administration's American Jobs Plan was the foundation for the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, and rail was a big part of it. The bipartisan infrastructure bill has advance appropriations to the tune of $66 billion over five years for rail. $22 billion is gonna go for grants to Amtrak, 24 billion for federal state partnership grants that includes the Northeast Corridor, $12 billion for partnership grants for inner city passenger rail, $5 billion for rail improvement and safety, and $3 billion for grade crossing safety. Again, stand out over five years. It also includes $36 billion for rail programs in addition to the $66 billion I mentioned. That is money that's authorized and will have to be appropriated on an annual basis over five years. That healthy baseline tied to the annual budget for rail is critical to sustaining the investment levels necessary to ensure that the US has many transportation options. With the American Rescue Plan now providing economic relief to millions of Americans, Amtrak, and transit agencies that were all hit hard by COVID-19 are in good position to make robust investments in transformative projects to build back better than we were before. How do we get there? Aside from major federal investment, which is needed first step, support from Congress, strong partnerships, and effective management of the environmental planning and review process is essential. This is true for locally driven efforts to establish new passenger rail service or preserve and restore service, such as those along the Gulf Coast where Amtrak ceased operations after Hurricane Katrina. By 2050, the population of the Gulf Coast mega region is expected to grow by an estimated 10 million people. That's a 76% increase for the reason for the region to, re to harness that growth, rail has to be a part of its multimodal transportation system. Amtrak intends to re reinstate that service between New Orleans and Mobile. This matter is now before the Surface Transportation Board. FRA will continue to participate in those conversations and administer several grants that would improve facilities supporting the restoration. I would be remiss if I didn't uh, mention some of the other developments regarding the Surface Transportation Board. The President's executive order on promoting competition in the American economy mentioned 
railroad track owners have to provide rights of way to passenger rail and strengthen their obligations to treat other freight companies fairly. Specifically, it calls for the vigorous enforcement of new on-time performance requirements and metrics and standards, and also to take the rights of inner city passenger rail into account when considering rail carrier mergers and acquisitions. We look forward to working with the STB's new inner city rail on-time performance uh, office. As noted, there's tremendous enthusiasm and public support for better passenger rail connections. Like the high-speed rail project in California along the Northeast Corridor, and also private sector initiatives like the one in Texas with Texas Central that would connect Dallas and Houston, or the Brightline projects in Florida, or that one connecting California to Nevada. The Biden-Harris's vision for improving passenger rail throughout the nation isn't a one-size-fits-all approach. Rather, we want to make sure that building back better is done right the first time and in a way that will work best for the specific area that has needs. As you may know, rail funding is unique in transportation systems because unlike highways and public transit, rail lacks a multi-year funding stream. Dedicated funding is essential to performing deferred maintenance, enhancing existing corridors, building new lines at in-demand locations, and getting state-level commitments, as well as building cap capacity across states and across the industry. We have a chance to bring about profound benefits and opportunities for the public to implement and explore everything from high speed and higher speed rail options to emerging technologies. The funding mechanism for the JOBS Act will be enacted through existing programs like the Consolidated Rail Infrastructure and Safety Improvements and Fed State Partnership Grant Programs. FRA is actually holding a webinar tomorrow for those interested in seeking a CRISI grant. And other NOFOs will be forthcoming. We've seen that throughout the course of the pandemic, important transportation function that long distance passenger rail services provide, they fulfill an important role in transportation and average ridership retention on Amtrak long distance routes are actually exceeding that of shorter distance routes in some areas. Most of the ridership on long distance travel is attributable to travel between smaller communities and population centers that may not have access to air travel or that have populations that require or would rather not drive long distances. Given the major nationwide re reduction in discretionary travel that resulted from the pandemic, the resilience of train ridership is something that we all need to keep in mind. Amtrak serves more than 500 communities across the country, offering inner city passenger rail service. Amtrak is a steward and owner subject to federal standards and requirements. And they absolutely help deliver significant and nationally important projects as well as own significantly, a significant and nationally important railroad assets, including most of the Northeast Corridor and several branch lines. Numerous Amtrak owned stations are prominent civic spaces, including Philadelphia's 30th Street Station, Chicago Union Station, Providence, Rhode Island Station. In the Northeast Corridor, fast frequent service between Washington DC and Boston that serves large and small communities is essential. Nationwide, a network of 15 long distance routes buttresses that network that Amtrak has on the Northeast Corridor, as well as its 28 short distance state supported routes. In several regions, especially the South and the West, Amtrak service has a strong demand and would have a good situation to grow if communities there demand it. Amtrak's network has not expanded in a generation and the time is ripe for us to consider it. 
FRA recently completed regional rail planning efforts in the Southeast and is close to rolling out its Midwest planning efforts. And I hope that RPA continues to be a part of that effort. FRA serves in many different roles at Amtrak, grantor, safety regulator, board member, lender, secured party, stakeholder, and others. We're very cognizant of our role with Amtrak and we want to set them up for success as we move forward with hopefully the bipartisan bill if the House passes it and if the president signs it into law. FRA will continue to work cooperatively with Amtrak. The expansion of inner city passenger rail service throughout the country is a cornerstone of the Biden administration's transportation policy. And we welcome Amtrak's Connect Us plan. And it's a very constructive addition to the ongoing dialogue for infrastructure investment. The public continues to look for as many travel options as possible that gets them to their destinations in a safe and reliable manner. We are encouraged by Amtrak's purchase of a new fleet set to replace its Ab Am fleet coach coaches. And we look forward to those coming into service as well as the new Acela trains that it has. This is an amazing time to be involved in the rail industry and FRA stands ready to provide support to state, local governments, communities, Amtrak, post railroads and other rail stakeholders across the country as we partner with them to plan and develop new rail services. There's a lot of work ahead of us, but one thing's clear, we need to seize this moment to build back better. Thank you again for inviting me to speak. I look forward to continuing the conversation and working with you in the months and years ahead. Thank you so much. Uh, and again, I. I Appreciate your uh, ending a crazy day by sitting down with us. It's always good to see you. Um, I know we have a hard stop, um, and I do have a fairly long uh, list of questions that have been supplied. Um, I don't know how you feel about it, but if we were to send some of those questions on to you after the end of this, would, would you and the staff be willing to, to take some of those? Yes, yes, okay. absolutely. Super. And we can definitely um, get through some of them right now. Okay, great. Uh, so I'll, I'll start with this one. Um, you know, as you know, the, uh, the JOBS Act uh, directs uh, you to come up with a program to develop passenger rail corridors after 180 days and then update that program annually. And it seems as if the corridor identification effort gives DOT a significant amount of leeway in establishing the program so that it's fair, so we see fairness and transparency. What are some of the elements that you think are necessary to ensure program success and to establish a pipeline of viable projects. We know that there's a lot of, of, of ideas out there for, for routes, um, but time and, and resources are limited. And what role do you see passengers being able to play in ensuring that the whole country benefits from transformative rail investment? And kind of a, a corollary to that, what would you tell the communities that don't get on that list the first time around? So it, rail projects absolutely start with community support and we wanna be mindful of that. And then uh, from community support to regional level and, and hopefully state and in some cases interstate support is uh, important as well. Uh, when it comes to the corridor program, we absolutely wanna hear from our stakeholders and the public and get their input uh, in that process. We know that there's some established corridors uh, already, some in statute, others, like I said, that we've studied through the Southeast planning process, the Midwest planning process, the Southwest planning process, and of course, those um, services along the Northeast corridor uh, and branch lines as well. Um, so that, that gives us a good foundation to do that, uh, but we absolutely want uh, more input into that process 
and we'll look to groups like RPA and your members uh, for that input. Uh, and if, uh, as that pro and, and very much that process will play out after the bill passes. So I don't want to speculate too much exactly what that will be. Uh, but whatever ideas and thoughts that you all have in the engagement that would be helpful, uh, we're all ears on that. And we want to um, listen to what you have to say, because we don't want to miss the opportunity to listen. Uh, now, inevitably, if, if there are places that, that feel uh, left out of that process, we uh, want to hear uh, from them and make sure that we uh, keep you all in mind. And we know that FRA, uh, ho hopefully again, all this is premised on the bill happening and, and becoming law, but we know at FRA, uh, we need to meet um, and be aligned with the new bill, which means growing and growing in the right way. So we wanna make sure that where we can provide assistance and technical assistance, to those places that are looking for service, uh, we can point them to the right way to do things and make sure that we provide resources, connect them to resources to take the steps that they need to take to get to that point where um, they can make projects uh, viable. Great, thank you so much. Uh, I think our next question comes from uh, Jim Subi a former member of my board and now a uh, commissioner uh, out in uh, Colorado. Jim, are you there? And are you able to uh, get your uh, get your camera on and ask the question? Uh, so uh, Jim did have his hand raised. Uh, I will uh, see if he's still here. So I believe Jim is actually no longer uh, in the. Uh, okay, so then let's move on. List. <laughs> let's move on to Phil Streeby, uh, who is a current uh, member of my board. Uh, Mr. Streeby, are you there on the phone? Phil, you can unmute. Uh, Bill? Okay, let's move on to another question. Joe, what else do you have uh, teed up for us? So actually, so uh, Phil did type in his, uh, his, his question in the chat. Uh, there has been a movement to establish a National Passenger Rail Commission within the FRA to promote passenger rail service. And Phil was looking to see if there was a comment from uh, Mr. Bowes on this. So that's uh, something that, that I actually haven't seen the, the details on, uh, but I, I, I welcome uh, any efforts to have uh, national level input. Uh, and it's something uh, worth considering. Uh, absolutely. The, the details are, are important. And uh, whenever it comes to national commissions, there's a federal advisory uh, commission process that we have to uh, follow. Uh, but um, I, I think that I've tried to engage with as many stakeholders as possible uh, throughout my uh, term here since January. And uh, I wanna continue to do that and um, always look for forums and, and all available avenues to, to have that dialogue and, and that input uh, because I think it's really important. And um, I also think that, again, what's about to unfold before us, uh, hopefully with the bill is uh, something that's historic and something that uh, we haven't seen the scale of on the passenger rail side. And uh, I am definitely open to ideas and suggestions on uh, how to implement that and then how to move forward uh, based on that. That's really important. And again, I wanna make sure FRA is poised to deliver 
uh, on the commitments from the bill and that we have partners in place at the state level, local level, regional level, who also have the capacity to deliver on those projects. And I'm really hopeful that it's a pipeline of projects that we have going forward. And then at the end of the five years, we can point back to positive results and positive outcomes that we can use as the basis um, for going beyond that. Great, thanks so much. Uh, listen, I'm gonna amalgamate, uh, there were probably six or seven different versions of this question that came okay. through the Q&A during different sessions today. So I'm gonna kind of amalgamate it into one question. Um, now that the metrics and standards are published, it's gonna take two quarters for us to see the results. And obviously the, the earliest that the Surface Transportation Board could take up anything is, is January, but in the meantime, on-time performance has just been pretty dismal. Um, I mean, we're seeing like 7% OTP on, on the sunset. Is there anything that FRA can do between now and when STB can act? And, and then again, what role, if any, uh, does FRA see itself being able to take in that regard? So we wanna, I'll take the second part first. We definitely wanna provide any technical uh, assistance that the Surface Transportation Board needs uh, as they uh, get up and running uh, on, on their responsibilities um, for, for metrics and standards and, and on-time performance. We've, for the past several months, we've been making sure FRA that Amtrak and the railroads can uh, certify schedules. That, that's been uh, a big undertaking for us. Now, absolutely not losing sight of current on-time performance. So uh, we wanna be mindful of that. And I take uh, opportunities to remind uh, railroads uh, across the board and then um, specific railroads of their uh, obligations related to on-time performance. So I am uh, absolutely willing to look at specific uh, situations and see what the FRA can do right now uh, to do that because we don't, we don't want things to get worse and we don't want to start from a bad place uh, when it comes to on-time performance. Uh, so I, I definitely wanna be mindful of that, especially at a time when we're in the midst of a pandemic and, and ridership actually isn't to the levels that we want to even get to. So if, if there are issues right now with on-time performance, uh, even with Amtrak being back at full service, but passenger ridership levels not being at pre-pandemic levels, um, we, want to, we want to make sure that that's done right. So I'm, I'm, I, I'll look into that. Appreciate that. That's terrific. Thanks so much. And I think uh, we're going to have to do one more question okay. to wrap it up. Uh, and uh, that question comes from uh, our, uh, our Ron Kamenkow, who is in uh, Nevada. And that's going to have to wrap it up. And as I said, uh, thank you so much. And we will uh, pass the rest of the questions on to, to you and the staff. Um, Ron? Thanks, Jim. Uh, yeah, my name is Ron Kamenko. I'm not sure if you all can see me or not and how I would go about getting the video started. It is, uh, so unfortunately, Ron, it is actually just audio. Okay, no problem. So anyway, yeah, I'm Ron Kamiko. I am the RPA Council representative for the state of Nevada. I'm an Amtrak locomotive engineer. I came off of Norfolk Southern, and before that I worked for Conrail as a brakeman conductor and an engineer. And I'm also the general secretary of the group Railroad Workers United. My question is about crew size and actually on freight trains, but I think this uh, is incredibly important for passenger trains in particular on time performance. Um, as an Amtrak engineer and as a freight engineer and conductor prior to that, I have interfered with Amtrak trains and now as a current Amtrak engineer, uh, I am interfered by freight trains and it seems to be getting worse. And one of the many reasons it's getting worse is that the trains are no longer five to 7,000 feet long, but they tend to be 10 to 15,000 feet long often. 
I work on a subdivision that's single track with sidings. The long freight trains often cannot fit into those sidings. So trains five and six, the California Zephyr can be on time at Reno. It could be on time at Salt Lake City. But by the time it gets to the Elko, Quagmire, and down the single track in the Nevada subdivision, it could be one, two, three, four hours late. My question actually is about crew size. The Federal Railroad Administration under Joe Sabo said that it was important to have uh, not a single point of failure, and therefore we needed a minimum of two persons in the crew of freight train. The administrator, Ron Batori, under Donald Trump, said it does not really matter. The unions and Railroad Workers United all say it is a safety issue, but it is also an efficiency issue. If any of these trains have any difficulty out on the line of road, it is so much more time consuming to deal with those problems if you do not have a conductor aboard the train. And that means huge Amtrak delays would ensue if we did go to a system where through freight is being operated by one engineer in the cab or a locomotive. So to make a long question short, as the head of the FRA, what position do you intend to take on the question of freight train crew size going forward? Uh, great question and, and thanks for uh, bringing it up. So back in uh, February, uh, a court uh, vacated uh, FRA Trump administration's preemption order when it came to crew size, and it sent the rulemaking uh, to FRA. So what does that mean? It means that, um, that FRA is working on a rulemaking uh, regarding crew size uh, right now. It's in the process of developing that uh, notice of proposed rulemaking. And um, we actually think without this rule, railroads could be subject to different uh, requirements across different states. Uh, so it is something that we're looking at right now. We've announced in our uh, spring regulatory agenda that that uh, rulemaking would address uh, potential uh, safety issues. And, uh, and that's why we're uh, moving uh, forward uh, with it. And it's going to be open to uh, public comments. So um, I would urge you and, and others uh, to let us know um, what you said about long trains. Um, as you know, long there's no regulation on train size uh, right now. Um, FRA is absolutely conscious and making sure that there aren't any communication or loss of communication issues um, on long trains. Uh, also, we're looking at um, if there's uh, issues with in-train forces when you have um, a train of that size, and also making sure that there's uh, an appropriate level of uh, training as well. Um, we've also heard from communities that have experienced long trains uh, the amount of time that that causes to cross uh, a grade crossing going from one side to the other uh, of the tracks. So we're mindful of that. The um, bill uh, that I mentioned, the infrastructure bill actually has in it um, a provision to uh, study uh, long trains and the impacts that they, they have and uh, FRA actually is conducting its on own study. And um, we have been engaging and we will continue to engage with uh, stakeholders in the industry from it so we can hear from uh, all voices who um, have uh, information to contribute so that we can have a holistic uh, picture on the long train uh, issue. Thank you so much. Uh, we are over time, and I apologize for keeping you later than I promised, uh, but, but thanks so much uh, for, for joining us uh, today and helping us close out this conference. 
Um, we, uh, I, I told the group, but uh, just before you arrived, that you know, we one of the very first conversations that you had was with us when you you took over, and um, we're very great, very grateful for that, uh, and uh, we're looking forward to uh, a long and, and very productive uh, tenure for you. Uh, at the agency. So thanks again for, for being with us today. Thanks for your insights. Uh, we are here to work with you and help you. And uh, with that, we will, uh, we will finish the conference and thank you again for being thank here. Thank you. Take care thank you. Me.